Hello and welcome back. This is the second part of our restoration of the HP 410C vacuum tube voltmeter. This 1960s high performance voltmeter was the successor to the old tube 410B model and has already two transistors in it. But it still retains a tube for its input and output stages. This tube is responsible for its thought after 100 megaohms input impedance. In the first episode, we started with two donated units in rather poor condition. We were able to bring one of them back to life, but the other one, which was actually in far better cosmetic shape, was put aside after we found that it had a burned out primary transformer. However, let me start with a bit of good news about that second unit. It has now found its way to snowy Austria and is in the hands of a furry animal puppet that promised to take good care of it. This industrious puppet lives on the Atkelar channel. Atkelar approaches electronic restorations like one does classic cars restorations, disassembling everything to the last bolt and opening every switch for cleaning. He volunteered to take on the arduous task of rebuilding the transformer, so I sent him the unit. Way to go at Kalar! I'll link the video in the doodly doo, so go over there and give him a big thumbs up of encouragement. But back to our first unit, we had temporarily repaired the dead photo chopper by using the neon bulbs we had on hand. These were NE2 indicator tubes, better known today as A1A. They are very common, still used as dirt cheap power on indicators in modern appliances. It was relatively easy to adapt the photo chopper oscillator to this common neons by changing the values of the few passive components in the oscillator module. But the markings on the original neon bulbs revealed that they were NE2U tubes, known as A3C today. These are higher brightness and longer life variants, which are particularly good at striking in the dark. I bet they have a spicier touch of radioactive gas in them. Their high brightness makes them perfect for turning on photoconductors like in our photo chopper. They are still made and not too expensive, so I ordered a few of them. Not that I plan to use the VTVM for the next 25,000 hours, mind you, but it makes me feel better to use the optimized type that the designers intended. So finally I got the correct um, neon lamps to go into the chopper. So those are the high brightness, high current, but somehow long life, 25,000. Irish. Um, so they should be closer to the original, so we need to go back in there. So we had to readjust the resistors and caps for our new neons once again, which is no different than what they did at the factory back then. Caps and resistors were hand selected to match the pair of neon tubes in each photo sensor. And now that we have a perfectly working instrument, we'd really like to do something about the AC probe. See, this instrument could be optionally ordered with the HP 11036A probe, which promised calibrated AC measurements from a few tens of hertz to an astounding 700 megahertz. This high frequency performance is courtesy of yet another vacuum tube, a high frequency diode enclosed in the rather fat probe. Tubes might have been large, expensive and power hungry, but when it came to high input impedance and high frequency operation, they were far superior to early transistors. Plus, I'd really like to see if our old HP 410C can kick the butt of our new orange key sight multimeter in the high frequency AC measurement department. Sadly, original HP probes are rather rare and are being peddled at delusional prices on eBay. But what about using a period imitation? Also, Eric, you've yes. gotten me the parts I was missing or some close approximate. I did, the probe. Yes. So it's an AC probe that's meant for a, a Hickok voltmeter, but it's so close that I think we can just use it. It's the same schematics, just a different divider. It's yeah, the resistor divide. value is a little different. And it has a little tube in there. There you go. Here you go, and there is a fast diode in yeah. there, so it goes supposed to go 
up to 700 megahertz. Yeah, something like that. Pretty uh, high frequency. Calibrated, yeah. and then you can go past that uh, uncalibrated. And the only difference with the HP is that the HP requires a 22 mega ohm, and this is a 30 something mega ohm mm -hmm. resistor. Yeah, so the the dividing ratio would not be correct. Yeah, 36, I think that is. Yeah, it looks like it. And of course, since we've touched it, it's now less than 36 mega ohms. Oh, well, we can <laughs> clean it. <laughs> So I was trying to figure out what the difference is between the HP probe and this Hickok probe and that's the deconstructed Hickok probe and uh, so the way it works there is actually a capacitor in here after the probe that's embedded into here and then it goes into the valve and there's a little circuit and that screws up on top and we already knew that the resistance is wrong but except from that, the two probes are very similar. That is the HP probe, and that is the Hickok probe. And it's basically the same thing. It has the capacitor over here inside the tip of the probe. Then it has uh, the diode and, and an RC a resistance and uh, a, a another capacitor. And actually I have shown here what the circuit actually is. It's a cap. The diode, uh, I finally figured out what it does. It's, it's a zero volt clamp. It will have the effect of putting the most negative point of the wave at ground. And then it will go up from there. And it's, there's just an RC averager. It's not your regular detector. It's, it's just a, a, a level shifter and an averager. So it seems like Eric probe is actually working. Uh, so the first thing you have to do is to zero it. It's fairly sensitive. And here I have about 1.5 volts. Oh. The meter just pegged. Yeah, at a thousand hertz. A 1.516. There we go. So that's one kilohertz. Uh, yeah, change frequency. It's, it's coming from over here. We, we have Ken is super busy over there. So give me, uh, I don't know, 10 kilohertz. Okay. There we go. There we go. Fix that too. 10 kilohertz. Oops. And well here I'm 1.53 and it's pretty darn flat. Okay, give me one megahertz. And it's gone down a little. The scope still says 1.51, but this is gone down a tiny smidge and go 10 megahertz. Oops. How about 11? <laughs> <laughs> 11 megahertz will work for me. And oh, and here I have uh, so the generator is not flat, it tells me 1.56 volts, so put it at 1.45. Uh, volts RMS? Yeah, Volts RMS. And yeah, let's put it back at 1.52 over here. And that thing. So I need. Oh, where, where, where are I've you? I changed it. Yeah, no, go, go back to uh, where it was. How's that? Yeah, 1.45 as measured by the scope. Okay. And then I have to adjust this guy a little bit. I might not be able to get there because it's still the wrong resistor. So I, yeah, I, I maxed it out. Okay, she's all done. But if you're like me, you probably wonder how good is my replacement probe. So we, we know it's not going to be correct until I replace the resistor. Uh, but how is it going to do in frequency? And to find that out, we have a debauchery of HP equipment. 
I have a modern key sight uh, which goes to 100 kilohertz. I have the famed uh, HP 400E uh, which is just an AC voltmeter and goes to 10 megahertz and mine that's we don't know potentially the probe can go 700 megahertz but it's probably not compensated right for uh, this instrument because of the original Pro. From uh, 0 to 10 MHz we're going to use the uh, output of the Keysight uh, wave generator that's uh, part of the scope and then we are going to use the RF equipment for higher frequencies. Turn this one on because it turned itself off and uh, on the generator we had 50 Hz This one is giving us 492 millivolts RMS. This guy, I calibrated it uh, when I repaired it, so it's pretty much on the money. It tells us about the same thing. And this one is 0.48, but it's not right because of the resistor. So uh, we're mostly going to look at how flat it stays and I am going to increase the frequency. The um, original HP Pro is supposed to be very good, like a few percent from 0 to 100 megahertz and then 10 percent uh, above that to 700 megahertz. The Hickok probe is less good. Let's go to 1 kilohertz. This is 1 kilohertz and it basically hasn't budged. 10 kilohertz, so flat, another factor of 10. 100 kilohertz and not much variation. And the first one we should be losing is the uh, key site over there. Yeah, it pretty much tops out at 100 kilohertz. It's at 200 now and it has dropped. So that one gone done we lost it at 100 kilohertz and now we can focus on those two one megahertz staying flat there's some oscillation on that one oh it's getting lower oh it's getting lower because the, ha, it's measuring correctly the signal on the scope is getting lower if you can look at it i'm at three megahertz and it's getting lower so those two are going lower and this is exactly what I'm getting here. They are doing both what they should. Now I have a problem with my source, but you can, you can see here I'm at 20 megahertz and this one has really sagged more than the signal. I think this one is going fine until 10 megahertz and then we can't tell because of the limitation of my equipment. So now we are going to switch to RF um, and for the RF in order to do it correctly you would need a little probe like this old tap i don't have that so i have made my own improvised version uh, but i have to switch generators okay so i've now reconfigured myself i have this source going and i measure the power here with my improvised pickup to uh, the meter we repaired and I uh, regulate the power through that power meter at 3 dBm. So this is controlling this in a closed loop. It's going to uh, keep it at 3 dBm no matter what reflections and losses I have in there. Right now it's at 10 megahertz. And I'm going to jump in uh, steps of 10 megahertz. 20, 30, 40, 50. This is still flat and steady. 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, it's starting to go up, 120, 130, 140, 41 up 10%, 150, going more up, 60, 70, 80, 200, going down, probably some kind of reflection, 200, 230, 240, 250, 260, 70, 80, now it's starting to go up, 300 megahertz. And now, 320, 330, 340, 350, this thing is increasing, so uh, we'll see where it goes. It looks like 
there's a resonance over there yeah but it keeps going up so at this point the, the reading is not reliable anymore we are at half a gig keeps going up whoa huge peak at whoa at 650 so big compensation problem peaking at 700 which is the max of this probe so this probe was probably peaked for a different instrument you know if I had a recorder I could trace the curve and I do have a recorder a restored one let's try it so we are ready for the, the grand 1960s style experiment and off we go is it going? Yes, it started. So the output of this, there's an output at the back, is connected to Y, and the output of the sweep of this unit is connected to the X. good about to 300 megahertz and then it gets out of hand and I have this huge overcompensation spike at 700 megahertz uh, but it detects signal to 1 gigahertz no problem so th there is nothing in that circuit that should have a spike and I just should get a signal as proportional to the AC on that side no matter what um, so I'm a little stumped. There's a difference in how it goes into the instrument. In the HP, there is a very small averaging capacitor, which I not s I don't even think it's real. I think it's just a capacitance of the lead. And then there's the actual averager is in the instrument in the Hickok probe they have a bigger capacitor they have also some some chokes to isolate for for rf leaks that shouldn't do any, any difference and but it goes straight into the instrument and straight into the meter it, it's just it has no electronics involved uh, other than what's in the probe so i should get a flat signal out of the out of the Hickok probe, I don't understand why I would have a resonance at 700 megahertz. Uh, my only thought was that maybe this is not doing contact correctly and is capacitive, capacitively coupled, so I have to redo that thing a little tighter. And then I'll change the, the resistor on the RC circuit so I can measure what the capacitance of the probe is in here what it is 10 nanofarads so it's higher than the one that's spec on the HP but that shouldn't make any difference filter the filtering capacitance after the, 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 the diode clamping is 1400 buff. HP only has 250 picofarads, which I think is mostly the capacitance of the lead and has the filtering capacitor back in the machine. And this one has a filtering capacitor right here, then a choke, then it goes to the machine. But that shouldn't make such difference either. All right, so I'm going to try to replace the 36 actually may go with the correct 22 and I don't think the value of the caps should do anything should not be critical okay here we go All right, so I already also soldered it here. I think that will make things a lot better. Yeah, I put the probe back together. Let's see if it behaves. 
Okay. So that's better. It's it's more in the middle before it was sort of extreme. And the next one is five volts. So it's, yeah, there we go. So here's five volt AC. All right, so it should be calibrated. Now let's see what it does with frequency. 100 megahertz, holding steady. Yeah, it's rising again. It is. Well, maybe not. No, it had a little bit of a bump. 200 megahertz. It's rising. 300 megahertz. And it's doing the same as before, it has this huge resonance. So this I do not understand. It has to come from the probe itself. Oh no, we have fallen victims to the RF parasitic resonance problem a most annoying fact of life when working with RF circuits. You can spend months chasing problems like these. With my 1 GHz scope, I was able to confirm that the resonance is very real. You could see it on the amplitude of the RF signal after level shifting by the diode. Somewhere in this simple cap plus diode RF circuit, there is a parasitic inductance that is in parallel with a parasitic capacitance, which I suspect is the parasitic capacitance of the diode. Unfortunately, the way the probe is constructed with everything soldered inside a lacquer tube, there is no easy access for further RF debugging. And God only knows if this is the correct low capacitance diode tube in there. So I decided to let it be, content to have added AC capability to my HP 410C up to 100 MHz. We'll take it as a partial win until the proper HP probe materializes. And yes, it sure trances my orange keysight meter, so mission accomplished. See you in the next episode!